Hello everybody, good evening and welcome to the United Stands. I'm Mark Goldbridge and this is your latest Manchester United news as we fly straight into it. Um, and uh, look, I don't know why that keep, de keeps delaying there. It's getting on my bloody nerves, to be honest. But uh, hello, loads to get into on the show tonight in what has been quite a huge blow for Eric Ten Hag as Sir Jim Ratcliffe flies into Manchester and starts laying down the foundations for the footballing side of things that he wants to set up. And this is not going to please Eric Ten Hag in the slightest. Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about this ridiculous situation with, um, with Anana. Uh, and what he's actually doing at the moment. I don't really understand what that's all about. Um, incredible, really, if you ask me. Uh, and also, um, with regards to the Sancho thing, we can talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, lots to talk about there as well. Um, and a few other bits as well. Um, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on with this. Yes, let me sort this out for you as well, because we're sponsored by Boohoo Man. But yeah, it's a big blow for Eric Ten Hag in relation to the news that's coming out today, because basically he's going to have his, control uh, reduced and he, need, he needs to accept that or fight it and we'll talk about what that means but this is feeding on from what we were talking on about last night if you think nothing's happening at United and they're just hiding away after bad results sticking with this manager you're wrong there are huge internal conversations going on that are going to dictate not maybe not our next three or four months I think Ten Hag is here for the next three or four months to the summer, but our next three or four years. This is this is big, big, big business, and it's big, big news. Um, okay, but before we get into that and get into your questions as well, uh, just a few uh, early uh, super uh, not super chats chats here. Um, Mark, why do we play move the ball so slowly? Says Michael, especially Anana slowing the play down. Uh, also, Mark's tired. Says Jacko, and uh, Arba says I love men. Well, you know, you know, if that's your new thing in 2024, it's always been your thing. Well done. Well done. But uh, anyway, look, before we get into this, this is cracker. This is a cracker today. A cracking bit of trivia. If you know anything about Boohoo Man, I'm wearing my Boohoo Man hoodie. They've got some fantastic stuff there for you. Get yourself kitted out in 2024 with some Boohoo Man clobber. Whether you're down the gym, chilling out, five aside, whatever it is, they've got loads for you. And you can get an extra 10% on their site-wide 70% discount at the moment. You can get 77% off with the code Goldbridge. Link is in the description or scan that QR code next to me. Some fantastic fantastic clothing in there from Boohoo Man like this. I love this. I think it's a great hoodie. But um, also, um, they always give us a little bit of Manchester United trivia when they sponsor the show and 2024 is not going to be any different. So can you guess this player? I was born on the 2nd of January in 80, 1988 in Amsterdam. I began my youth career at Ajax but moved to United to be part of the youth setup in 2014. I made my United debut on the 28th of April 2016 replacing Rojo in a 3-2 win over Arsenal. During my time at United I played 16 games and had loan stints with Crystal Palace and Fulham. And in 2021, I joined Leverkusen for a fee believed to be in the region of one and a half million pounds. It started off so promising and it ended up quite bad. But uh, of course, it is not Nanny. It is Timothy Fozu Menza. And the first person I saw was Alex, who said, Alex Eastwell, who's called him Focus Menza. But it was Fozu Menza. So well done to you there, Alex. Uh, well done. And big shout out to Boohoo Man as always. Make sure you get your discount with the code Goldbridge. Some fantastic stuff you can get hold of, like this hoodie. Happy New Year to you and yours. Hopefully January can be the cornerstone for a new era, who says Angry, uh, who's been a member for two months. And also, Mark, why can't we make Mount play like a proper like number eight, like Mainu, says Fleeko, who's been a member for six months? Uh, because he's the number 10. And uh, putting a football structure in place will help Help Eric Ten Hag be successful. This is what's happening. He's a coach, not a manager. Akash, thank you very much for bringing us to the headline of the show. We will be talking about Anana. We will be talking about a few other things. And I want to summarise the Romano show from earlier that many of you have seen already, but just pick up on some of the things that he said. But I want to start off with this. So basically, two big stories coming out today. The first of all, the first story is that um, Manchester United want to potentially bring in Dan Ashworth, who is Newcastle's sporting director and has a good relationship with Sir David Brailsford. So they want to bring Dan Ashworth in from Newcastle, which would be a significant uh, appointment considering Newcastle are a very interesting project. And he went from Brighton, where he was very successful. But they want to bring Paul Mitchell in as well. And Paul Mitchell, obviously, is a director of football that we've been speaking about for about a month. 
I was told last month that he will be coming to Manchester United. He's out of work at the moment, having left Monaco. A very rich CV. And a lot of people, you know, we wanted Paul Mitchell when Ranjik was here. He's got a good relationship with Ranjik. So he's a good director of football. But the prospect of bringing in Paul Mitchell and Dan Ashworth is very interesting. You know, you go from a club that's not really had football people above the manager for a decade to suddenly having two of the better appointments you could make in European football. It would be significant. You can't argue that. And then you've got Blanc as CEO, who was at Old Trafford today. And suddenly the football structure doesn't have an, have an, an excuse. Doesn't mean it's going to succeed. Doesn't mean it's going to succeed. But there's not an excuse when you bring in people like Blanc, Ashworth and Mitchell. The flip side to that coin is what does this mean to Eric Ten Hag? And as Rob Dawson said in the SPN, this would be a major problem, a significant blow to Ten Hag because Eric Ten Hag under his current contract has a veto. If he doesn't like a signing, he can say no. You know, he has a strong say in the transfer policy of Manchester United. Now, Eric Ten Hag can't be blamed for spending £85 million on Anthony. He can be blamed for saying he wanted Anthony, but he doesn't negotiate the deal and he doesn't do the wages. So that is not where Ten Hag should be blamed. But he could be blamed for the players that we bought, whether it's Mason Mount, Anana, whatever. So the thing that really, really hits me here is Eric Ten Hag is in a meeting with Sir Jim Radcliffe and Sir David Brailsford. And they say, we are bringing in Dan Ashworth and Paul Mitchell, and Lauren Blanc, uh, and Blanc's going to be the not Lauren Blanc, the, and Blanc's going to be the uh, the CEO, yeah. And Ten Hag says, "Well, have I still got my veto?" And they say, "What's your veto?" Well, if I don't like a signing, I can say no. Um, and so Jim says, "No, it's gone. We will listen to you, but you're not having the final say because we're bringing in good people. And also, Eric, with all due respect, we're not going to get Dan Ashworth to come to Man United." And we're not going to get Paul Mitchell to come to Man United if we tell them that you're in charge of the final decision on transfers. That's not how it's going to work. And also, Eric, this is for the betterment of you anyway. You're, co you're a coach. Um, if you want to sign Kylian Mbappe and Dan Ashworth says we're, si says we're signing Vout Veghorst, then there's a problem. But this will be everybody working together. The problem here is that if Eric Ten Hag... He's not in a position to argue this. Look at, you know, he might be losing his job in the summer the way things are going. So he's not in a position to argue his case because he's not in a strong position. He can't sit there and go, that's bloody ridiculous. Look at what I've done at the club. You've got to be backing me. At the moment, he's in a very weak position. So I, I think this is very easy for Sir Jim Radcliffe or Sir David Brailsford to say, look, we're bringing these people in. They're going to be in charge of you in relation to recruitment. You'll be answerable to them. You can put recommendations forward, but that's what... A, but this is what a director of football does, by the way. I'm not against this. I mean, I'd, I hope that Ten Hag's going to be part of the future. But I'm not against this. Because this is exactly what I would, would have stopped the Anana deal. Because Ten Hag would have said I wanted Anana. And then hopefully a Paul Mitchell or a Dan Ashwood would, would, would have said, you want me to get rid of De Gea for nothing and spend £50 million on his replacement? No, I'm not doing it. And, and it wouldn't have happened. So this is exactly why it needs to happen. And it might have been that I want Mason Mount. Well, we're not getting him because Chelsea want £55 million. And we're not paying any more than 40 because he's got one year left on his contract and he's had a crap season. We're not paying £55 million for him. And, and that's exactly why you do need a director of football. You do need um, a sporting director because they, they have to have the ability and the power to say no. Now, they shouldn't be saying no in the sense that we need a striker, you're not having one. The Glazers haven't got any money. That's not what I mean. The job of the director of football and the, or the sporting director is to work in tandem with the manager, but be authoritative as well and say, sometimes I don't think this is the right player. Um, and I think that's really, really important. Now, why is this a blow to Ten Hag? Because you might look at it and go, well, how can it be a bad thing? It's a bad thing because Ten Hag might not like it. And he might have to lump it. But it's a bad thing because Ten Hag had it and it's going to get taken away. And if you are a manager of a McDonald's restaurant and, you know, you are in charge of uh, hiring, firing the staff. And then suddenly someone comes in and says, you're not doing that anymore. You're just you're doing everything else. You might get the hump. You, you might not like having that t responsibility taken away from you. It's human nature. So it's going to be very interesting how this pans out because... If you do bring in a Dan Ashworth type or a Paul Mitchell type, they have to be given the authority to do their job. 
because their job is not to coach the team and get the results. Their job is to look at the club in a very helicopter view, looking down at it and going, these are players that we can bring in for the next three years. You know, th that's their job. Ten Hag's job is to utilise those players in a vision, but make them win by coaching them. So I'm all for this. I'm all for this. But there may be bumps in the road because Ten Hag's going to lose a bit of authority, um, which he needs to lose. Will he be happy losing it, though? He might say, I'm not happy about this, and he could be gone. Um, so it's going to be very interesting. And But you know what? We were sort of ahead of the game with this last night when we were talking about the review of Sir David Brailsford. These conversations, whether you want Ten Hag to stay or Ten Hag to go, these are very significant times at Manchester United. And they're very precarious conversations. We're in a bad situation as a football club, not just because of the results of this season, but because of the last 10 years. Even if United were in the top four, I still think the same conversation would be going on because Sir Jim would quite rightly say, yeah, you're in the top four, you're still in the Carabao Cup, if we were, but we're not in a title race, Eric. We need to be in a bloody title race. So these conversations were going to have to take place anyway. They're difficult conversations. And of course, as I said last night, within these conversations you're going to also get a conclusion over the next couple of weeks where if Sir Jim is sat there with Ten Hag and Sir David Brailsford and Ten Hag says, I'm not happy about having my authority taken away, they'll walk out the room and go, maybe this guy's not the guy. Maybe he's not the guy. We get through to the summer. We're not making any significant signings in January anyway. We get through to the summer. We get the guy in and we work. Because they might. the, the structure to me is starting to look like Sir David Brailsford and Sir Jim as the head of the footballing side of things, Blanc as the CEO running the club, and then you've got Ashworth and Mitchell as in the John Murta roles, and then you've got Eric Ten Hag. It very much looks like the structure that they are building is very, very different to one that we've had in the last 10 years. And the coach becomes a coach who basically is... You know, Mourinho said it himself. When he was there, he felt like he was everything. CEO, director of football, you know, every interview, it was always Mourinho and coach as well. That's going to change. And who knows? They might come in and go, we want a, we just want someone who's going to be a coach and coach. Yeah, I mean, they might want Graham Potter for all I know. Um, anyway, let's have a look at what some of you've got to say. Can I just say as well, I've, I feel I have to say this. If Gareth Southgate ever becomes Manchester United manager, there will not even be one minute where I give him a chance. I will be Southgate out from the very first second he gets the job. Now, people might say that's very, very unfair. I will absolutely give him no time at all. He is not a Premier League manager. And if Man United or Sir Jim Radcliffe thinks that Gareth Southgate can manage Man United, I will be out Southgate from day one. So I'm just saying, I'm just letting every, oh, I'm just letting the community know. I don't even care if we win the first 10 games. I will still be Southgate out. He is not to be Manchester United manager. Just if anyone thinks it's a good idea or anyone thinks let's give it a chance, I'm telling you now, as an Englishman, absolutely not. This guy picks fucking Calvin Phillips. He's played 89 minutes of Premier League football. No, 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 no. Erfan, welcome to Members Club. Get your badge in. You're an absolute legend. Thanks for supporting the, the channel. Charles says, Ten Hag has to be a semi-sporting director on top of being the manager. He should appreciate the help. I agree, Charles. Um, 17 months a member, Charles. Thank you very much for your support. I think people overlook the importance of Overmars at Ajax uh, as well. The structure made Ten Hag sec successful there, says Rob. And, yeah, and, and you know what? Let's not forget, Eric Ten Hag might also walk into this meeting and say, I'm over the moon. This sounds great, having Paul Mitchell and Dan Ashworth. This sounds absolutely brilliant. It would probably not be unfamiliar to Ten Hag in relation to his Ajax days, so he might really like it. Um, uh, Akash says, Eric Ten Hag regains his power by winning trophies. Uh, and he also says, putting a football structure in place will help Ten Hag to be successful. He's a coach, not a manager. Um, exactly. I completely agree. So get your thoughts in on that. But uh, very interesting how that's going to play out. If Southgate becomes manager, I'm done, says Lloyd Davies. Look, I don't for one minute. The, the, the people I would have in charge of Man United ahead of Gareth Southgate is endless. You know, absolutely endless. I'd give Tony Pulis the job. I would give um, Gary Neville the job. I'd give Ollie the job. I, Southgate is just not... This is a guy who, who got Middlesbrough relegated got the under-21 job because he wears a nice suit, and then has managed England, and I could manage England. They've got so many good players, and he's not won anything, and, he, and he's football shit. No, 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 no. 
Uh, Mark, really, realistically, who do you think we're going to get? Uh, Dybala or Werner on loan, says Grosser. Well, look, I want to talk about that in a minute because um, um, it's well worth watching the interview that Beth did with Romano this afternoon. But I, I, there's a couple of bits I want to sort of summarise and get into. But uh, I'm really interested in how these meetings are going to work out. And as I said last night... Um, these are very significant a couple of weeks at Old Trafford and um, these are conversations that, that, that need to happen 100%. 100%. Um, just another quick bit of uh, topical news. Uh, you might have seen it this afternoon. Um, apparently, I find this incredible. I find this absolutely incredible and I've not really had my say on it, but a lot of United fans find it incredible as well. So I think I'm on the, you know, you know, I think I think I'm on the majority side here, but let us know your thoughts. So, you know, Anana was looking to delay his join up to the AFCON um, and wanted to play against Wigan next Monday. Apparently, he's now delaying it even further and wants to play against Spurs as well. Um, his first game in the AFCON is the day after the Spurs game. Um, and then if 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 his team go out of the AFCON in the group stage, he'll be back for the next Premier League game. I mean, it's just don't go to the AFCON. Do not go to the AFCON. I mean, this is just pure and utter desperation. He's shitting himself that he's going to lose his place. And it's just not a good look. It's not a good look at all. Like, you were going to go to the AFCON, and now you're cutting down when you're going at all. It's like it's like when you've got to go to your in-laws for Christmas. We'll arrive on Christmas Day at 11 o'clock and we'll be gone by 3. You know, don't bother. Just don't bother. Why are you go? This is, I mean, you're retired from international duty. You've now gone back to it and you're taking the piss. I don't want to join up early and do all, you know, all the team camaraderie and training. I just want to turn up the day before. Don't go to the AFCON. Simple as that. You know, you can't be playing for Man United and the next day flying out and playing for your country. Don't go to the AFCON. But the, the bottom line is... Why was he going to the AFCON? Because I think he thought he was going to be fine. I think he thought he could go to the AFCON for a month, come back and win his place. He's shitting himself. Let's be honest. He's absolutely shitting himself. He wouldn't have given a shit about the FA Cup or the Spurs game if he'd been playing well. He's shitting himself that he's going to lose his place. I don't think it's a good look. I think it's a bit of a weak look. And again, I think this comes down to... You know what concerns me the most? Some people would pin this on Ten Hag and say, well, Ten Hag looks really weak. You should be sending him off to the AFCON. Have you ever considered that Ten Hag clearly, probably might have bought another dud in Beinder as well? Because he's given him no game time this season and he's actually welcoming, it, welcoming to the fact that uh, Anana wants to play for, against Spurs and against Wigan. If, if, if Ten Hag is okay with this, it makes me really wonder about what Beinder's like. Because honestly, what he should be saying is, piss off to the AFCON, we'll be fine. And the fact that he's going to play for us against Spurs and then fly out for the next day. I mean, this makes me really wonder about Beinder. Because Ten Hag's got a role in this. He could easily say, fuck off to the AFCON. I'm playing Beinder. And the fact that he's not makes me wonder about Beinder. Because we haven't even seen him play a minute yet. So, I mean, I don't want to heap pressure onto Eric. But it doesn't look good for Beinder when he's played no minutes. And now we're trying to get him to play... Uh, the, the, the week you know the week the day before he plays in the Afcon but um, yeah it's just it's a it's another it's another weird one for Manchester United isn't it um, so SD says I'm okay with any structure as long as Man United is playing the football we've grown up seeing and yeah Southgate can f off uh, should Ineos speak to Ronaldo about United's problems as Majek? Um I wouldn't actually be opposed to speak you know if I was doing the um, the review strategic review. I would speak to Oli. I would speak to Jose. I would speak to Ranić, especially. Um, but I don't know whether they will. Um, but, you, you know, as much information as you can get. What's best website to get tickets for Old Trafford, says Jack. If anyone can let him know, that'd be great. And uh, also, um, yeah, I mean, look, I'd done the video on Jaden Sancho earlier if you've not seen it. So I'm not going to talk about Sancho massively because a load of people have been moaning about the fact that I got quite passionate about it. What's the point if you're not going to be honest? I mean, I'm, I've, I've never not been honest with my opinions about, um, you know, United. I mean, there's just no point in doing this game if you're not going to do it properly. Um, some things I get very passionate about. But, you know, talking about the Inanna situation, let's just remind ourselves of something I didn't mention on the Sancho leaving video. Um, 
Manchester United paid £75 million for Jadon Sancho two and a half years ago from Dortmund. Two and a half years later, we're loaning him to Dortmund and paying some of his wages. I mean, this is embarrassment FC. I mean, Pogba, we paid £89 million to Juventus and let him go back on a free transfer. I mean, th there's, a, there's a theme here. And I know... It's unfair to moan about it in some ways because we're about to change all that, hopefully for the better. But we're still damaged by it. It's, it's incredible. And this is what I mean about progress. It's almost an open goal for Sir Jim Radcliffe because there's so many things that you can get better than the past easily. I mean, just start looking at the player's personality for a start. Start negotiating better. I mean, it's embarrassing to be loaning Sancho back to Dortmund just over two years after spending 75 million quid on him. It's just an embarrassment, is it, when you think about it like that? Hi, Mark. Do you think uh, JCB's appointment is delayed because the CEO job includes commercials of the club, which falls under Glazer's responsibility, says uh, Rasta Lion. Um, yeah, I don't know. No, no. What, what I've heard about uh, Blanc and Mitchell and everybody else is that those appointments probably won't be authorised until the Sir Jim Radcliffe deal has been authorised. And remember, they said it would be six to eight weeks. I don't think it will be that long. I think it will be by the end of the month. So uh, we may not get official announcement about Blanc and the director of football until early February. I think that's just natural, really. Uh, welcome to the Numbers Club, Q Bay. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you joining the club. Uh, get your badge in there. Um, when I say get the badge in, it's because everyone who's got a membership has a badge in the live chat. Um, is Murta in charge of this transfer window, says Terp? Well, Murta was pictured today with Sir Jim Radcliffe, so he is still very much there. Sir John, uh, Sir John Murta, I'm not bloody giving him a knighthood. Um, I, I, I think that um, John Murta might survive at Manchester United. He really shouldn't. I mean, he really shouldn't. Sarah loves a badge. Ultras, ultras, says Akos. Badge gang, says Slip. Um, thanks for your support, all the members, by the way. Happy New Year. Rooney in, says Azza. As if. As if. And um, But look, I think with regards to Mitchell, um, not Mitchell, Murta. I'm getting mixed up myself here. With regards to Murta, he needs to be sacked. It's a very big statement to make, and it's an open goal statement. He needs to be sacked. And the simple reason he needs to be sacked is John Murta's been at this club since the days of David Moyes. When, Oli, when um, the director of football position was given to John Murta, remember the words of Oli Gunnar Solskjaer. You see, I don't just watch United and do content. Like you, I watch United and I remember things. And United, under the Glazers, hate people like that. They hate the fact that you might remember a quote from a couple of years ago. And I remember a quote from Oli Gunnar Solskjaer when the director of football job was given to John Murta and Oli Gunnar Solskjaer said, the position has basically been created for somebody who's already doing the job. So John Mert has been director of football at Man United for many years, really. He's been heavily involved in recruitment for many years. So when I talk about signing Sancho and sending him back to Dortmund on loan, or signing Pogba and sending him back to Juventus on a free, John Mert has got his fingerprints on all of these. Um, the De Jong debacle, the Rabiot debacle, you know, he's involved in all of this. And he can't be involved in the future. He's had his chance, he's got to go. And I think he will go, but it's not impossible that he won't. So, he's, you know, he needs to go. Um, but he will be in control of the January transfer window. But, of course, he's got no power. Um, Eric Ten Hag can say, I'd like Timo Werner on loan. John Murta can sort that deal out. But Sir Jim Radcliffe will get the final say on whether it happens or not. Um, so, you know, he's working with his hands tied behind his back. Grace says, I've played the game, Southgate in. You can do one, Grace. And hi, Mark, what would you want the new regime to do to win over the fans, says PSSY? Win. Win. But also, more importantly, uh, you know, I hope, I hope a lot of you... It's left over from New Year. Um, I hope a lot of you listen to the Goldbridge Saves Football podcast. It's a great bit of content. It was out again today. Um, really enjoy doing the podcast. And if in 2024 you're not listening to podcasts or you weren't aware of it, please do go and give it a listen on Spotify. Um, but I was saying on the podcast today, I didn't, you know, was, Will was asking me about Man United. And I said, 
after that Forest game at the weekend, and I know you'll feel the same because we spoke about it in the match reaction, after that Forest game at the weekend was a real low, really, because it wasn't the loss. It was just, it was the, it was the nature of the loss. And it was the, the amount of losses and performances we've had that like this season. It was almost the loss of hope, um, the lack of belief. And if I'm being completely honest, the dislike for the team. Not all of them, that's not fair, but there are there are elements of that football team that I just dislike. I love Manchester United and that will never change, but I dislike some of the players that play for the club. And that's a really hard thing to have as a fan. And I know Liverpool fans had it for a number of years and I know Arsenal fans had it for a number of years and I'm sure other clubs have it as well. It's not uncommon for fans to dislike certain players because they don't think that they're good enough or they've let them down. And I think that, that that's that's something that Sir Jim can change quite easily. Is I don't want passion merchants who aren't good enough because I dislike them. But I certainly don't want talented players who can't be asked because I dislike them as well. And I think by changing, you know, and, and you know, someone like Sancho going could be a big part of this, but by changing the profile of player that plays for Manchester United. Look, if I was a Brighton fan, I'd love those players. Some of them are limited, but they play a, they play a style of football for the badge in a way that's entertaining. And I think that is how you win the fans back because United fans at the moment we're almost like we're like we're, we're like we're like vampires. We're, we're being deprived of life. You know, we need some life. We are a football club in the world game that loves football. And has an identity of loving football. And that's been taken away from us for 10 years. We haven't played good football for 10 years. I know we haven't won trophies because you're not going to win trophies if you don't play good football. But we, we need that back. We need that pride back in our team. Now, pride is also very easy to confuse with passion. I don't need someone to run around putting tackles in and go to the crowd, but they couldn't pass a fucking parcel. I want the Roy Keynes. I want the Paul Inces, I want the Dennis Irwins, I want the Mark Hughes's, I want the David Beckhams, I want the players who are good enough but can also put that effort in every single game. And those players exist. They're not the Holy Grail. They're not impossible because they're playing for Man City, they're playing for Brighton, they're playing for Arsenal, they're playing for Liverpool, they're playing for Real Madrid. There's plenty of these players about but our recruitment has ignored it for too long. We've got to bring in the right profile of player. And it might take a bit of time, but that's the easy win for me. The, 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 you know, and this is what Paul Mitchell will be looking at. And he did a very good job at it, you know, especially when you look at Southampton, people like Sadio Mane. We need to bring these sort of players in. Won't forget the account in the Murta Madness boat, says Mario Franco. And also, Eric Ten Hag opinions matter not a lot. Me, I want to have him his way for years to come. Guess he's got only weeks at best. Hey ho, maybe we appoint Wayne. Josh, what is this Wayne Rooney bollocks? It's never going to happen. So David Brailsford could equal Sir Clive Woodward at Southampton, says Matt. Easily. Easily. Uh, darts, watch along. I missed it, Jay. Sorry. Uh, Lee Willoughby's gifted a membership, uh, by the way. And uh, But a very good question from Psycho. And um, yeah, that's what I would want to happen with Manchester United, without a doubt. I want to see us get our personality back. Um, too many times. Too, you know, I remember being at Crystal Palace, Man United at Old Trafford under Mourinho and the amount of people that were just bored and fed up and didn't like the team. We've got to stop that. That's been the consistent of the last 10 years. Chikorito says, I'm, just, I'm going to talk about transfers in a moment, moment, but let me just answer this super chat. Chikorito says, what are your predictions for the remainder of the season and how do you see our transfer activities in the summer if we somehow get top four? Um, we're not going to get top four. Um, and therefore, if we do get to top four, I will celebrate it like a trophy. We're not going to get top four. We're not going to be in this F uh, Champions League next year. And I'm, I'm, you know, it's sad to say that in January, we're not going to do it. We're not going to turn it around. Um, I think the FA Cup is absolutely essential. But the problem we've got with the FA Cup is we really need a lot of luck in the draws. We need to be avoiding the, the big teams all the way through to the semi-finals, the final ideally. Uh, and also in the FA Cup, we need to see, well, Arsenal are playing Liverpool on Sunday, so that's one of them out. Uh, we need someone to knock Man City out. Um, 
yeah, we, we need a bit of luck in the Cup. But we've I, I think the Cup is the only thing that can rescue our season. Win the FA Cup, that gets you into the Europa League. Maybe finish sixth. That that that's about the limit of our season. I can't I can't see it massively improving. There's so much pressure being put on the return of Martinez and Casemiro, and I, and, and I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference really, um, because unless he's going to go Casemiro, Mainu, and Bruno for the rest of the season, unless he changes his midfield, I just don't I don't I don't see it. I really don't. But that's why I'd sell McTominay. I'd sell McTominay for thirty million pounds now because you've got so many options in the midfield when Mount and Casemiro and Eriksson and Mainu and Bruno. You don't need to keep and Amrabat's here till the summer. You don't need McTominay. I'd sell him. Get rid of him and use that money now. Um Nickett says, Mark, that's why Ronaldo got frustrated because he always had that mentality and say what you will, losing games pissed him off the most. Look, Ronaldo was toxic. I love Ronaldo, but he was toxic. But you can be toxic in the right way. Ronaldo was toxic because it pissed people off, people off in the club. Ronaldo could not stand the fact that we were miles behind Man City and not winning. And he moaned about it. And it pissed people off. But he was coming from the right place. He was coming from the place of, I want to win. Like myself, I don't like change. Found it hard when Ferguson left. We just need to trust the new process, says Lee Willoughby. Well, let's talk about the January transfer window because there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of bits in here from uh, the Romano interview. Um, uh, Shawnee De Devil says that's not toxic then. Well, of course it's toxic. It's just a different type of toxic. If he kept his gob shut, then, you know, the dressing room would have been happy, wouldn't it? You know, it's... It, it, it's... It's toxic because he shouldn't have been doing it. He's not the manager. Like, you are basically creating dressing room and, you know, the Piers Morgan interview create, created a load of toxicity. He was, you know, he was right about all the problems and he was doing it because he wanted to win. But that's not the way about, that's not the way to do it. That's not, that is not, a Piers Morgan interview is not the way to do it. Of course, that's bloody toxic. Um, just, you, you know, but I think, it, I think it was pure desperation at the end. Don't we also need to uh, drop out of the top four? Uh, don't, don't we also need nice knees to drop out of the top four, says Jeed? I don't know about that rule because uh, Man City have got the same problem as well, haven't they? Um, anyway, anyway, let me talk about uh, some of the stuff Fabrizio was talking about this afternoon. You can check out the full video, um, but the one thing I wanted to sort of home in on was, um, and, we, and look, Beth spoke about all sorts, Mason Greenwood, Varane, Casemiro, um, players leaving, McTominay, Martial, Sancho. There's just two areas I'm going to talk about. And you can watch the rest later if you want to. It's a very good interview with, with Fabrizio at the start of this transfer window. Transfer window. But um, in relation to the strikers, I think it's very, very clear uh, from what Fabrizio says it's, is that we, we basically have a short list here. You've got um, Garassi, which is only an option if we pay his release clause of uh, 17 and a half million euros. You've got Werner, where we've spoken to him, but we haven't spoken to Leipzig yet. Uh, but it's early steps with, with Werner on loan. You've got uh, Malin, which is also on the list, but of course is another loan. Um, and you've got um, Chopper Moting at Bayern Munich, who doesn't play very much anymore because of Harry Kane. Um, he's not getting any game time. Uh, he's not going to the AFCON. And he might fancy a move to Manchester United at 34 years of age. So that is sort of Man United's options in the striking market at the moment. And Fabrizio basically said loan to buy is probably the best solution that Manchester United can look at. But really, it's Malin, Chopper Moteng, Werner. Um, I think that's about it. And, it and, and, and as Marvin says, why is it all Bundesliga? I don't know. Maybe that's because the, the, the best value is there at the moment. I don't know. Uh, Damien says I'd go Malin or Garassi. Garassi worries me because it's permanent. I, I don't think a permanent deal fits in with what Ineos are doing. If I was Ineos, I wouldn't want a permanent deal because I'd be thinking that's too permanent. Um, uh, you know, unless you're ringing up Paul Mitchell and he says, yeah, that's a good deal. I, I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's a good deal. I do not think and I'm prepared to be proved wrong. But I don't think Garassi for 15 million is a good deal. Because if it is, why ain't Real Madrid looking at it? Why aren't Arsenal looking at it? You know, why aren't Spurs looking at it? Um, they're not. Spurs aren't looking at Garassi. Arsenal aren't looking at Garassi. Um, the Garassi ain't always greener. 
and I do not think that he is the right profile of player for Manchester United. So I, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't pay for him. I think you've got to go loan to buy. Try before you buy. I think you've got to look at that, and therefore you, you sort of leave yourself with Malin, Werner, or Chopper Moting. Well, Chopper Moting's a waste of time because you ain't trying him before you buy. He's 34. That's just a stopgap. So that you know you're in you're in the category of Veghorst and Agallo again. So I, I wouldn't bother with Chopper Moting. There's no future in it. Werner's still in his 20s. Malin's even younger. So I think it's got to be Werner or Malin. Now, I've got no confidence that either of them are going to be good enough, but at least if you get them, you can send them back. And at least if you get them and they do well, you can do loan to buy. So for me, the options aren't great, but we're not in a great position. We can't be buying Osman or Tony or anyone like that. This is the best deal we can do. I think it's got to be Werner or Malin on a loan to buy. Um, and the fact that we're doing a deal with Dortmund... Sancho makes me more convinced that it's probably going to be Malin, who has a lot of potential but hasn't delivered. And he, you know, let's not forget, Sancho delivered at Dortmund and didn't deliver in the Premier League. Malin's not really delivered at Dortmund, and how's he going to deliver in the Premier League? Um, it's slim pickings, really. But what you've also got to remember is these players aren't starting anyway. These players are going to be backups for Hoyland um, and this will only happen if Martial goes so an easy draw in the FA Cup resulting in a trophy will just be another false dawn mark a harder fought run would build stronger players for next year says Josh I'm not going to disagree with you on that um, but the second thing I wanted to talk about was um, the defence so defensively this is what Fabrizio had to say about Tadebo. He said he was um, a target for Spurs, but the deal's fallen through. It's completely off now. And that um, Ten, Ten Hag likes Tadebo. It was a player that he was looking at in the summer. He's very much on the list for Manchester United. There's a chance that we'll wait until the summer, but that could change. Um, he's definitely a player that Ineos like as well. So... It could happen in January, but it's probably a deal United would like to push to the summer. Now, I'll talk about why that is in a minute, but there's a really good update from Fabrizio there because we know Ten Hag likes Tadebo. He wanted him in the summer. And we also know from what Romano has said that Ineos really, really do rate Tadebo as well. So you've got a manager who likes a player and then you've got the football side of things who are coming in who likes that player. And also he plays for Nice, which Sir Jim Radcliffe slash Ineos own. So Tadebo to Manchester United does look very, very probable. Um, it's just when it's going to happen. Now, I think Man United would like to wait until the summer for many reasons. Financials probably as well. Maybe even Tadebo wants to stay at Nice and wait until the summer. But what might force United's hand is Chelsea are apparently lurking around. And I think this deal will accelerate if another club comes in pushing for Tadebo. If nobody does, I think United will be let, will, will be happy to wait until the summer. But if if it gets forced forward, then I think United might have to do something. But, you know, um, it's interesting. And also what was interesting as well is, is what Fabrizio said about the Varane situation, where he said that Varane wants to stay at Manchester United. He had a Saudi Arabian offer in the summer and he said, no, he wants to stay at Manchester United. He wants to play in Europe. But Manchester United have basically given him a choice. You either leave and are free in the summer or you take a reduced wage on your contract. So United are playing hardball with um, with Varane. Rightly or wrongly, they're playing hardball um, to reduce his wage. And as I said on Twitter today, it's all fine and well targeting Casemiro and Varane and De Gea to, because you want to reduce the wage bill. But we gave a player 350k a week on a massive contract in the summer so we're hypocrites really and and again it comes back to the same old shit doesn't it it's like sending sancho back to dortmund on loan when we gave him 75 million i mean i can't get my head around that you know it, it, the, the, in a non-footballing way imagine this you buy a ferrari off the guy down the road for a lot of money you don't really get on with it so you, so you send it back to you, to the guy. He's got the money and he's got the car back. 
I mean, it's just, that's how thick this Sancho deal is. You know, I know he had to go on loan somewhere, but the symbolism of him going back to Dortmund is embarrassing. At least if he goes to Leipzig or West Ham, he's not going back to the club that he gave a load of money for. I mean, it's absolutely incredible that we gave Dortmund 75 million They've still got the 75 million and now they've got the player back as well. It's, 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 it's just crazy. Absolutely crazy. But it's only the same as, yeah, we're getting rid of Iran, our best centre-back, um, because he's on big money. But we've given Rashford 350 grand a week on a new contract. And it's just it's just arse about face with United. How can you justify reducing the wage bill, but then you've got a player on ridiculous money? I don't know. Not that they would care, but Ten Hag should be drilling it into the players that they owe the fans the FA Cup after last season, like the Doc in 76, says Glenny Boy. Um, Lee Willoughby's gifted a membership, by the way. Well done, Lee. And um, uh, Michelle says they've got to reduce Rashford's wages too, if that's what's planning. They're never going to reduce Rashford's wages because Marcus Rashford is has got a very, very good team around him. Um, and I think they pulled United's plant, pants down and I don't knock them for it. You know, there was talk of them going to PSG to talk about that. He was down into his last 18 months of a contract. I said it at the time. Rashford is going to absolutely win this war because he was down to his last 18 months. He could easily say, I'm not going to sign a contract. I'm going to run it down. Um, in which case, the club would have won, lost tens of millions. He was always going to get a massive wage. And United allowed that situation to develop. And uh, they had the pants pulled down. Simple as that. Um he shouldn't be on 350k a week. He should no, no player at United should be on 350k a week. But when he's only got a year and a bit left on his contract, and he can say, "Well, I'm not signing one. I'm just going to go for free." United crap themselves and have to give him what he wants. And um, yeah, the thing is, reducing the wage bill is never going to work at Man United. It's a problem. Liverpool have a really good wage structure, and I think their biggest earner is Mo Salah. And no Liverpool player can moan about that because Mo Salah is one of the best players in the world. But at Man United, we're going to end up with one player, like probably Rashford, who's going to be on hundreds of thousands of pounds more than everyone else. But there's going to be players in that team who say, well, I'm as good as him or I'm better than him. This is stupid. So if you're going to reduce the wage bill, you've got to take them all out. You have to. But United are never going to do that. So they better hope Rashford becomes the best player in the team again Otherwise, it will cause dressing room unrest because people will be going, why is he on such big money? This is, this is a thing with it. I, you know, I really do think that most of us could do a better job as a director of football of that football club because we understand football and we, and we understand Manchester United. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, welcome to the Members Club. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Pogba went back to Juve. There was symbolism there, but look how that's worked out, says Philip. And as Fergie said, no player is bigger than the club. This is Manchester United. Uh, Year says Rashford's untouchable as well. Um Mate, if I could reduce Man United's wage bill and nobody was on more than 200k and I could press that button, I'd do it now. The number of players we'd lose would be disappointing because I like some of them. But, you know, if you're going to reduce the wage bill, you've got to do it for everybody. You can't have one player or two players on double the money everyone else is on. It's just, it doesn't work in the modern game. Footballers are like everybody else. Imagine at your workplace, right? Imagine at your workplace, you go to work tomorrow and there's, there's 10 people who work. You, you work in an office, yeah? Everyone's doing the same job. And there's 10 of you. Um, and then there's four or five people that are on a lot more money than you, but they're good at their job. That's aspirational. You know they're better than you. And you've got the opportunity to work hard and get that. Or if you, or, And if they don't pay you that, you can go to another company, another club. Now imagine that situation where there is a wage uh, structure brought in. And one or two people in that office are part of the old structure on way more money than you, but you're better than them. It's never going to fucking work. It's never going to work. Because human nature will be, that's not fair. That's just not fair. And the club can't just go, well, they're part of the old structure. Fuck that. He's earning double the money I am and I'm better than him. Piss off. And and this, this is the thing. You can sell a dream about we're reducing the wages and we're getting rid of Varane, but we all know there's not just Varane on big wages at that football club. So, you know, it's easy if those players deliver, but when they're not delivering and they're not consistent, it becomes a problem. If we loan Sancho back, then that tells me Sir Jim will not improve us. Foreshadows more years of horrible transfers. Player power wins again. Look, I, 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 
I've got no problem with um, optimism, but you have got to be real. Somebody said Sir David Brailsford equals Clive, said Clive Woodward at Spurs, which was somebody who went in with expertise in other sport and failed in football. Um, you have to bury it and try and ignore it. But there is the prospect that Sir Jim Radcliffe doesn't work. There is the prospect that this is a failed operation. There is the prospect that the Glazers are still here and everything still remains crap. Um, we're entitled to optimism and I think there's some open goal wins like getting a proper CEO and director of football in. But there's also no guarantee it's going to work. Um, you know, I'll put my hands up and say I'm, I'm on the optimistic camp because it needs to work. But there's no guarantee it will work. And as I said a few weeks ago, we're acting like no one else is doing this. We're acting like we've got the secret potion. Everyone's been doing it for years. Everybody has been doing this for years in the Premier League. Liverpool have, Arsenal have, Man City have, Newcastle are doing it. You know, we're not the only club that's got the idea of having a director of football and a CEO who know what they're talking about. And it then comes down to what budgets you've got. Because you can have the best director of football and the best CEO, but if you haven't got the budgets in this game, you're going to miss out on the best players. There's not an infinite pool of footballers. Each summer, there might be three really good strikers. Just because you've got a director of football who's told you to buy him, you've also got to have the funds to go and beat the other clubs. So let's be real. There's there's no guarantees this will work. If we loan Sancho, we've done that from Jose. Thank you very much. Um, Barry, who's one of our members, says that Eric Ten Hag is way out of his depth. I think I like what you're saying there, Barry, because I think with Ten Hag, it's going to be sink or swim. Alan Noonan says, Happy New Year, Mark, and the team. Hopefully United, a big clear out in the summer if it's been a frustrating season. I think this summer has to be massive. I think this summer has to be symbolic, and I think this summer has to be a statement summer. Um, I think there'll be money to spend, but part of me, and I've said this for a couple of years now, and I know a lot of you agree with me, yep, spending money is great. It's always exciting to sign a player, but we've had so many bad years now I'd actually be excited about selling some players and and selling players that need kicking out, not just loan Donny van der Beek or loan a young player or release a player at the end of their contract. I mean, actually boot some players out. The same way, I mean, Pep's done it for the last couple of years. Mares has gone, Jesus has gone, Sterling has gone. You know, he's selling those players. The media might not pick up on it, but he's actually booting them out. We We just don't do this. And we need to start doing it. Of course, we need to start doing it. Ollie says, sell Rashford to lower salary demands of the team. I don't know whether I'm saying that, but I think that it's um, it's very difficult to reduce the wage bill and then have one player who's on double everybody else's play money. Because um, uh, it, it only takes them to have a bad period in the team and it creates resentment. Um, yeah, but just going back to what was said there about Ten Hag and, and he's out of his depth. I quite like the swimming swimming pool analogy because I, I would definitely say that you might be right that he's out of his depth, but I, I think this is definitely going to be sink or swim. Uh, Whale I am says, would you sell, can we have a Rashford poll? Well, we don't, we're not scared of doing it. So would you sell Rashford? Yes or no. Um, but look, in relation to Ten Hag, I think he's going to sink or swim. And I think he's I think he's already doing that now. I think the meetings he's going to be having, it's going to be about whether they want to work with him and whether he wants to work with them. So it's sink or swim. And then if they do want to give him a chance, it's sink or swim on whether he can improve the results. But I'm not going to rule out the fact that he could swim. Because if I'm a manager of a football club and I look above me and there's incompetence and then I look down... And I look up again and then there's competence. I might swim better. So with Paul Mitchell, maybe a Dan Ashworth and a Blanc, his job should become easier with a better support network of, in, of, of competence above him. Um, it's going to be down to whether Ten Hag can convince them. Um, and as Alpha Gaming says, time will be running out for Ten Hag. Yes. Um, look, he's got two massive games coming up. Wigan in the Cup. I know... On paper, you expect to win that game, but it's all you know, those games are dangerous. It's at Wigan, 
it has happened before that, you know, I remember is going to Burton Albion with Ronaldo and Rooney and Sir Alex and drawing. So, you know, everyone's going to say, oh, Wigan, it'll be an easy game. And fingers crossed it is. But those games can go wrong even when you don't think they're going to go wrong. And you can get cup upsets. And also, those are the sort of games that if you're a Man United player that can't be asked and wants the manager sacked, that's the sort of game that gets him sacked. You know, if he loses to Wigan, you can lose a Premier League game and you can bounce back. But if he loses to Wigan... <sighs> so I wouldn't be by any stretch of the imagination saying, oh, Wigan's a walk in the park. I think it's an absolute dangerous game. Um, and then you got Spurs a few days after that where they're having a good season. They won't have Son. They won't have Basuma. They won't have Saar. They're having a good season. They play good football. They're coming to Old Trafford. If you lose that, big, big trouble. Big, big trouble. And as we've said before, you know, you can look at the league table and you look at the next Premier League game and it is Spurs and you look at the, the points gap between us and Spurs, it's eight points. You win against Spurs, it's five. So that game is is absolutely massive as well. But I, I, think, I think the FA Cup and every, every game for Man United is massive now because... We just can't afford to we can't afford to lose any games. I mean, I'm stunned by this. I'm absolutely stunned by this. Would you sell Rashford? 79% yes. 21% no. Alpha Gaming, thank you very much for your super chat, by the way. And um But come on. I mean, I'm in the no camp at the moment, but that would worry me. If I was Marcus Rashford, that would terrify me. If I was Team Rashford, that would terrify me. I mean, I, 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 it saddens me that we're at that point where, and I know, look, 3,000 people voting is not a massive pool of people, but I think that just shows you the, the overall picture around Rashford at the moment is not a good one. Um, you know, the wage, the new contract, the failure this season, the games where he's just not looked interested... Um, the lack of goals, the lack of performance. But if I was defending Rashford, I, I have to be consistent here and say I moaned at the start of the season that we played him up front. Um, he's been on the right wing. He's been up front again at the weekend and he scored, to be fair. But what is abundantly clear to me about Marcus Rashford at 26 is that he is not a striker and he is not a right winger. Now, whether he should be or not is up for debate. When you're paying 350k a week, he should be able to play up front and he should be able to play on the wing. Uh, I'm sure if you ask Mo Salah, he could do it. But he is definitely only a left winger. That's all he is. He's a left winger who likes to invert and shoot. That's what he is. I can see it. So should Ten Hag. So should Manchester United. His best position is a left winger. And that's it. I don't think he offers much as a striker. And I don't think he offers much off the right wing. So in defence of Rashford, we should stop trying to find a place for him elsewhere and just give him the left wing place. And if that's not where he's going to play, then maybe you need to let him go. But I think that it's a, it, it shocks me how many people would cash in on Rashford at the moment. Um, and it shocks me every day how many... United fans seem to have fallen out of love with Marcus Rashford and it's not easy to get that back. Um, Lux says Rashford is an exp expensive luxury. Um, but that's that's a worry. For, uh, that's a worry for a guy who has huge success off the pitch. Um, it, it, that's a massive worry. I'd be worried about that if I was him. I'd be worried about that if I was the club. I'd be worried about how you turn this around. Um Maybe you should do an interview on the United stand. That's the way back, mate. Um, there are reasons. Uh, there are many reasons to sell Rashford, but the way in what the main one has nothing to do with him, but our terrible board wages that completely ruin the team will never improve until we fix our wages. Well, you know what? I respect Jason there. I think that it actually is a very grown-up reason. You know, actually, if somebody said to me as CEO, we've had an offer from PSG um, for eighty million quid, sixty, seventy million, whatever. Um, and Rashford's interested, do you want to do it? I might go, yeah, just to take the wages away. I might do it. I might just go, look, long term, that's not a bad deal to do. 
And that's nothing to do with me not thinking he's a good player or, or anything like that. I think that make that would make a lot of sense to do that. And look, I'll repeat what I said two years ago. And last season, I was getting clipped up all the time. But the great thing is, Ricky said this to me. One bad take one year can be a genius take the next. He said, with wan I've been clipped up for saying sell him at the start. And then I get then the same clip 12 months later. They'll go, I was a genius. And, it's, and, and that's sort of what happened with my Rashford one. Um, at the end of the Ranjik season, I said, sell him. He just can't find a good... Look, they, I would love someone to find that clip again, actually, because it was taken out of context and it didn't come from a place of disliking Rashford. What I said at the end of that Ranjik season was, he can't buy a good performance at the moment. He'd been bad for months. And I said, he can't buy a good performance. He doesn't look happy. And actually... If PSG are interested, I think it's I think it I think it's a good time for him to go for himself for the club, and that's what I said, and I meant it at that time. And then next the season after, he was bloody brilliant, and everyone was like, "Look at Goldbridge with this idiot take," but look at that clip now. Can't buy a good performance. Doesn't look particularly happy. Would probably benefit everybody if he took a move, but I guarantee in six months that'll be a bad take again. Um, but. You know, I don't think Rashford wants to leave Manchester United and I hope he can recapture his form because what he did last season was remarkable, of course. But that doesn't stop the fact that I don't know the guy. I don't know what his motivations are. But as an outsider, I do think a fresh... Uh, I do think for some players, sometimes um, a change of scenery is a good thing. I think for Scott McTominay, a change of scenery would be great. I think if he actually went and played for a West Ham or an Everton where the expectations are lower and he plays every week, I think he could could be a really useful player for them. We saw that with Phil Neville when he went to Everton. We saw it with Nicky Butt when he went to Newcastle. They weren't playing much. They went somewhere where they were playing and they enjoyed it. Um, I think Harry Maguire, if he'd gone to West Ham and played every week, he would have been empowered by that. A change of scenery can be really good for a player. I don't think Rashford wants one, and I don't necessarily think United should do it, but it, nothing should be off the table when you're trying to rebuild a broken football club. I suppose that's the that's the line you have to go back to. The club is broken. To fix it, nothing should be off the table. Who knows what it's going to take to fix the club? So we can't, you can't, you can't. Let me use Bruno because everyone knows I like Bruno. You can't say we must keep Bruno. If we want to get back where we need to be, we must keep Bruno. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see Bruno part of that. But nobody can tell me we must keep Bruno. What, what if Bruno goes and someone else comes in and we build something new? Like, the, the, no, nothing, nobody should be guaranteed a future at this club. I think the only players that really deserve to be part of it, but doesn't mean they should be, are people like Rasmus, Maynou, um Ganacho. You know, the really young players that have shown promise that really haven't hit their ceiling yet. And, 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 and everybody else really should be should be under scrutiny. Uh, Austin says, at this point, would you like us to buy players from Man City? I know we don't normally buy from City, but what, we should buy the best from the best. Well, it's difficult to do it, Austin, to be honest. But of course, there's players from Man City I would take. Um, it pains me to say that, but there's players from Liverpool I'd take. I mean, I think we should have took... Ale I think Alexi McAllister was a, probably didn't want to come. But you look at how he went from Brighton to... Uh, look, to be honest with you, I've been looking at Brighton players. <laughs> I... I know it's an open goal, but I'd be looking at Brighton players for God's sake. I mean, if you're successful at Brighton, you've got a mentality and you understand football. Um, but I'd have took Alexi McAllister. I think he's done a great job at Liverpool. To be shocked about majority of fans wanting to get rid of a lazy player who doesn't play for the badge and gets millions is more shocking. It's a space oddie. All right, that sat me down. And Kean says, my mate Cathal says the only one who deserves 350k is Johnny Evans. And uh, a clean slate requires Rashford and McTominay to leave. Combination of not being good enough, downing tools for four managers to Sakib. But you know what as well? We've also got to remember that the home quota protects these players. It's not just because they come through the youth setup. It's because they're British. We are hindered by uh, the, the, the core of our British players aren't as good as they need to be. And they survive because of it. But that is why the likes of Maynou coming through um, and Ganacho, who qualifies as homegrown as well, is really, really important because it's going to take time to change the home quota. Um, is Marcus Rashford United's Theo Walcott? He is 28 now. No, he's not. He's bloody not. He's 26. 
26, and he's only just 26. Uh, he's 27 this year. Stop adding... You can't do that. You can't add years on. Um, where do you think we'll finish at the end of the season? Do you think we'll qualify for Europe, says Akos. Um, I, think it, I think if you don't qualify for Europe, then Ten Hag has to go. Like I, I don't want to put... Well, I, I don't mind, actually. Robert McCormack, I haven't seen him for a while. Happy New Year, Robert. But um, I feel that, um, yeah, if you don't... If you don't qualify for Europe, you've got to go. I mean, there's there's numerous opportunities. There's the Carabao Cup, there's the FA Cup, there's seventh place. If we don't qualify for Europe, you should be sacked. I mean, part of me thinks if you qualify for the Conference League, you should be sacked just for qualifying for the Conference League. But uh, yeah, we're not a football club that can afford... I'll tell you a story about Man United. We're not a football club that can afford not to play in Europe for two reasons. One, even if it's the Conference League, it's money and we need the money. And two, even if it's the Conference League, people will watch Man United. So we can't turn our nose up at Thursday night football because as much as we don't want to be there, it still generates a lot of money for the club. Even in the Conference League, it would generate money because that's the power of Manchester United. So we have to be in Europe. We can't just go, wow, it'd be better for the new manager to be able to train all week. You don't get revenue training on a Thursday night. You get revenue playing on a Thursday night. So... He has to qualify for Europe in some shape, way, shape or form. He certainly won't have Blanc saying to him, might be better if we avoid Europa League and focus on the team. Why? That mentality always amazes me, that people think we might willingly avoid European football. This is a club that will fly to the other side of the world to play five games in two weeks to generate income in, meaning, in meaningless pre-season games. And you think we're going to avoid Europe? Come on. I think selling Rashford would depend on the style of whoever next season coach wants to play. If you want to play possession-based football, you sell him, says Jason. And uh, remember that, remember though, if the most important thing of all, you can't say you want Ten Hag to stay and you want Rashford to go. Ten Hag loves Rashford. So, you know, uh, if Iran and Casemiro should go for wage, Rashford should be first out the door. At the very least, those two try. Lost my faith in Rashford this weekend with that ridiculous... Heel ball on the edge of the box. Oh, Jason, I'd forgot. I'd, I'd wiped that. I'd deleted that. That was in the recycle bin. You've just put it back. Uh, many seasons, you reckon, Evans has left, says Kean. Give him 350k a week. Uh, okay, this is getting a bit silly. Uh, please touch upon the bloated, useless scouting system, says Shiva. Well, all this will, will, will come in as well. Um, can we do a poll on Luke Shaw, to be fair, says Neville. Well, 80% of you would sell Rashford. I'm going to do this more tomorrow night. It's going to be a running theme in on the shows this week because I'm, um, I'm, I'm, well, I suppose actually for for all the members who watch the um, the video with me Ben Foster on the Christmas show, basically I asked Ben Foster this, so we're going to do this this week. All through the eight o'clock shows this week, we'll do this. Uh, would you sell Luke Shaw? Yes or no? Hmm, that was a lovely red. Evening, Mark, says Jacob. He's been a member for five months. Get your badge in. He says, evening, Mark. Broke my leg a week before Christmas and it's really annoying, but your shows have kept me going. Jacob, make sure you listen to the podcast, Goldbridge Saves Football. That's another hour to keep you occupied. Out today, Goldbridge Saves Football. Give it a listen. Um, the Luke Shaw one, well, look, completely different. 68% wouldn't sell Luke Shaw and 33% uh, would. So... If you're Luke Shaw watching tonight, you're in a bit you're in a bit of a better position. Slightly precarious, but much better. If you're Marcus Rashford watching tonight, give us a call. Let's do an interview and, and turn it around. Um, anyway, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, you're absolute legends as usual. You know that. Uh, make sure you smash a like and subscribe. If you didn't see my reaction to Sancho leaving, or you didn't know that Sancho was leaving, check out that video. And also, big shout out to Sam and Ryan and Matt on the United Stand uh, uh, Twitter account. Last Friday, they put an exclusive out that Jaden Sancho's agency was at Carrington for talks. A few days later, he's off to Dortmund. So there you go. Brilliant bit of uh, brilliant bit of journalism there, or whatever you want to call it. But if you've not watched my video on Sancho, it's only 10 minutes uh, long. Gives you all the detail on that. 
And then you've got the Fabrizio Romano interview that Beth did this afternoon. There's way too much for me to summarise and it would be unfair anyway. It was a really good interview from Beth and there's loads in there about Scalvini, Sir Jim, Ten Hag's job, Greenwood, loads in there. So go and give it a listen. Thanks everyone for watching. We're back at 10 o'clock tomorrow unless anything happens before. Take care. I'll speak to you all in a bit.